I want to look at part of one of the problems that we've done in our quantum mechanics course this semester. Uh, this is going to be just a piece of one of our homework problems, but one piece that I think is good to look over to understand how this works. This problem I'm looking at is a delta function potential energy well. We've talked before about finite potential energy wells uh, with a finite depth and finite width. We've talked about an infinite well with an infinite depth but uh, finite width. A delta function is kind of a limit in between those two. It's taking a well that has a finite area, making a finite well very narrow but very, very deep. And uh, that's our delta function. We're taking the potential energy for our function to be zero everywhere, but negative infinity at the origin. It's a standard delta function. I've normalized it in a particular way, inspired by our textbook. Uh, the potential energy function is minus h bar squared over 2m times alpha times delta of x. Alpha is just some constant to measure the strength of this well. And the h bar squared over 2m, m is the mass of whatever particle is trapped here, h bar squared over 2m is going to be just units of energy. It gives us a natural energy scale for the problem. So our goal, the goal I have, is to find the bound states, in particular the bound state energies in this well. We know there's always at least one bound state in any finite potential well, and maybe more than one. So we want to see what's here for this delta function well. Now, again, uh, we're going to point out we want a bound state energy. And for an energy state to be bound, that means it has, to have less it has to have less total energy than it would require to get off to infinity. Here, at infinity, the potential energy is zero. So for a bound state, we're going to have some energy E less than zero. Any bound state will have E less than zero, and that's going to be one of the pieces we work with. So we want to ask, what are the bound states? And to do this, well, we need to find what wave functions work, what, what wave functions will fit this story. Now, Again, I'm not going to do the entire problem from our textbook. I'm not going to go through every detail. I want to show you the wave function reasoning that we're going to use. As usual, anywhere that we have a potential energy that is constant, we, can use, we have some known results. If our energy is less than the potential energy, we've got a, an exponential sort of form. If it's greater, we have a sinusoidal oscillating form. So here, I see two regions where my potential energy is constant. One of them goes from minus infinity all the way over to zero. Then there's the delta function that gets in the way. And then there's another region from 0 to plus infinity that are our two regions. So in each of those regions, if we leave out x equals 0, we can split this into two pieces. We can split it into a psi left of x and a psi right of x. We can split our region into our, our wave function into these two regions, psi left defined for x less than 0, psi right for x greater than 0. And we can work out now what types of functions we can have there. Well, we know what those are. In each one of these regions, our energy is less than the potential energy. And so psi left of x, we could write, in general, as some constant a times e to the minus qx plus some constant b times e to the plus qx. And similarly, psi right can be written as c e to the minus qx plus d e to the plus qx, where in each one of these cases, q is equal to the square root of 2m times v naught minus e over h bar squared. That's our standard result for energy e less than v naught. But of course, v naught is 0 in each one of these regions, so I can just write this as the square root of minus 2me over h bar squared. So the point is, we're looking for the energies that are bound, that we can have in a bound state of this potential. If we can find q, then we know how to solve and find e. So our goal is going to be to find q, to find what values of q can work for this wave function. So this is our general equation, our general form of the equation. However, there are a lot of things we can do to make, a, make some progress here. So for example, we know that psi of x has to approach 0 as x goes to plus or minus infinity. Now, technically, in, a lot of, in scattering situations, we don't approach 0. We approach some uh, sinusoidal, sort of constant sinusoidal amplitude. We want to approach 0 if we're in a bound state. And if you're in a bound state, your particle cannot get away. So we know we have to approach 0 at either end. That immediately means that for psi left, when our x is less than 0, 
as x goes to minus infinity up here, that's part of side left's range, a has to equal zero. Or else that would blow up, put in a minus infinity here, and e to that, I get e to the plus infinity, it's terrible. Similarly, psi right is in the range where x can go to plus infinity. Psi right is over there. And that means that d equals 0 as well. My d coefficient can't be 0, or it can't, can't be non-zero, or else it would blow up going to the right. So I've already got this, con this constraint going on. That's helpful. To move on to make more progress, the, other, the next constraint I can use, we know that wave functions are always continuous. So that tells me anywhere these two wave functions piece, meet, meet up, namely at x equals 0, they have to be equal. So if we know that psi left of 0 equals psi right of 0, just plug in a equals 0 and d equals 0 up here. And then we plug in, for this condition, we just plug in x equals 0 for each one of these things. That'll tell me that b times e to the 0 equals c times e to the 0. Or in other words, b equals c. So already we've gone from having four coefficients down to having just one arbitrary coefficient. In fact, in the end, that last coefficient, I'll, I'll focus on c. I'll just leave c as my term. Uh, that coefficient c is going to end up being just what determines the normalization. And if all I care about is finding the allowed energies, I don't care about the normalization. So I'm going to leave that part out. I'm, I'll, I'll just use coefficient c, and I'll expect it to cancel out for normalization. All right. So that's our other condition. Finally, the last condition that we normally use for wave functions We've normally said that if v of x isn't equal to infinity anywhere, then the derivatives have to be continuous. Psi prime uh, left of x, or of, of 0, I guess, since 0 is our, our point of 0, equals psi prime right of 0. That's normally our condition. However, in this case, it's a delta function. We actually have uh, uh, an infinite potential energy issue. So we can't use this equation. We're not allowed to use that equation. Instead, what we're going to do is well, I'm just going to quote the result that we're the one part of our problem. I, I don't want to go into the derivation of it here, because that would be doing all your work for you. So let's look at this. Let's quote the result. It says that psi prime right of 0 minus psi prime left of 0 has to equal, instead of equaling 0, if, if we had, had non-infinite potential energy, that difference has to be 0. Uh, the result that we're going to use is that this is equal to minus alpha times psi, oh, I've run out of space, curses, minus alpha times psi of 0, minus, equals minus alpha times psi of 0 itself. So what this tells us, and I'm not going to try to derive this, as I said, the alpha is coming from this, the strength of our delta function potential energy well. And the psi of 0 is just evaluating psi of x at 0. In other words, it's equal to c or equal to b. That's our psi of 0. So in this case, we're supposed to be setting these derivatives. The difference in the derivatives equal to this thing. Think about what that means. Normally. If the derivatives are equal, that means we have a smooth function. Well, you have a reasonably smooth function there, depending on your mathematical definition. It doesn't, the slope doesn't change at that point. It's some smooth thing. Anytime you say that the slopes don't match on the two sides, what that tells me is that I've got some sort of a kink in my function, some sort of kink. And the strength of the well, that alpha, is going to tell me, is this a little kink? If there isn't a well, if it's alpha equals 0, there's no kink at all. Or is this a big kink? A big alpha will give me a very sharp kink. In my, in my slope, a sharp change in slope. So this is specifying an amount of change of slope. Well, we can do this. The derivative of psi right, we'll do that one first, is going to be derivative of this with respect to x is minus q, minus q times c times, and then, then I plug in 0. I evaluate the derivative at x equals 0, so, I, so times e to the 0, which is 1. That's my psi prime right, minus this one q times b, remember b equals c, so minus q times c times e to the 0, because plugging in x equals 0 gives me 0 again, uh, once I've taken my derivative. And that equals minus alpha 
times, and then again, psi of zero is equal to c, equal to our constant, alpha times c. So as we hoped, the normalization part doesn't matter for finding the energy. My coefficient c I can divide through by that. The left-hand side is just minus 2q. So uh, minus 2q equals minus alpha, or in other words, q equals minus 1 half alpha. That's our q value that we get out of this, solving this problem, sol solving for this thing. The interesting thing about this is that we've only gotten a single value. Our equations have given us a single specific value for q. And as we saw earlier, we're going to solve this for a single specific value of e. Let's do that. Let's work out our energy. Um, this is equal to the square root of minus, oh, I forgot my, <laughs> not minus, right, plus 1 half alpha. So minus 2me over h bar squared. We can solve that for the energy, square both sides, Square both sides, uh, multiply by h bar squared over 2m, minus h bar squared over 2m. We'll get minus h bar squared alpha squared over, squaring this gives me a fourth, times divided by 2 is 8m. And uh, that seems to be our whole story. Minus h bar squared alpha squared over 8m is our energy. And there's only a single energy. Only one result works. That's the only energy we have. And that, that kind of makes sense. If we're saying we have a certain size kink, let's think, let's think about what this means. My, my solution, my function here, is going to look like on the left, it's exponentially decaying toward minus x, on the right toward plus x. So I have an exponential decay that's symmetric on the two sides, like this. It has to be symmetric. That's what my results here are telling me. Has to be symmetric. and the derivative condition tells me the size of the kink. So if I, if I know it has to be an ex exponential decay and I know exactly how big that kink is in the middle, that, that entirely specifies, up, apart from normalization, what this function has to be. And so with that in mind, it actually makes sense that there's only this one energy that works. By the way, if instead of a delta function well, this was some very deep, narrow, fi but finite square well, if we had a finite square well instead, then I imagine what we'd end up with here would be, here's the boundaries of my well. I would have psi left true over here, psi right true over here, and then I'd have some middle section where the energy would be greater than the minimum energy, and I'd wind up with a sinusoidal thing in the middle. So any real well is going to be finite, and that sharp kink is going to be replaced by this little smooth bump, sinusoidal bump, right in the middle, patching those two sides together. As long as the well is narrow enough, we won't, like in the delta function, we won't ever get that second finite square well sort of solution. And we'll be stuck with just the single solution that we have over here. So I'm not going to go through all the other work to find the normalization and all that business, because those are different homework problems. And the derivation of this guy is kind of an interesting little thing, doing some limit of integration around 0 for the Schrodinger equation. But the result, I hope this sort of shows you how you work through this problem. You have exponential solutions that patch together at the origin with a sharp kink of a known size. And it gives us one specific energy that works.